Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session, um, E4. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, this is a session about better interprofessional communication improves patient care. Um, my name is Robert Varnum. I'm a family physician from Manchester in the UK and I work at the NHS Institute and uh, I'm chairing today's uh, session. Uh, my job is to uh, help us keep to time. Um, and so uh, I'm sure you won't have any difficulties with that. We have four um, fascinating presentations about some different approaches to improving interprofessional communication. And what we're going to do is we're going to have um, each of the presentations given to us and we'll have time for questions to the presenters straight after their presentation. But then at the end, after we've heard all four of them, I think there'll be some good questions and conversations we can have about how all of these four pieces of work fit together. You'll see there are some similarities and some, some strong differences uh, between them, and so it'd be really good for us to have a conversation and debate, perhaps, even about, uh, about the issues which come out of that for you and uh, for making professional communication better. Um, I'd ask you if you have um, a mobile phone in your pocket, if you could turn it to silent or vibrate now and just check that's on, that'd be really helpful. Um, and the other thing is this session is being filmed, so we ask that uh, when it comes to time for questions, um, if you could just stand up and make your way to one of the microphones, um, either on your left or your right, um, that's really important to make sure that your, your voice is heard on the recording and very helpful for the speakers as well. So, without further ado, I will ask uh, George Crowther to come and uh, begin our first presentation. Um, good afternoon. Uh, many thanks for coming today to this uh, short presentation on using the SBAR communication tool in mental health. Uh, my name is George Crowther. I'm a uh, fourth year specialist trainee doctor in old age psychiatry. I work in the city of Wakefield uh, um, for the South West Yorkshire Partnership Foundation Trust and uh, I'm also an honorary lecturer at Leeds University. Um, I've got no other affiliations other than to my trust and uh, the Leeds University. I've undertaken this project along with my colleague, George Smith, who's with us here today as well, who's Assistant Director of Nursing Education and Leadership and Development within the same trust. And also we've had statistical analysis and advice from Dr. John Stevenson, um, who's a Senior Lecturer in Health and Biomedical Statistics at the University of Huddersfield. So a bit about where we work. Um, so we work uh, within the South West Yorkshire Partnership NHS Foundation Trust, uh, which is a mental health trust that provides a range of community mental health and learning disability services to the people of Barnsley, Wakefield, Calderdale and Kirklees. Um, Calderdale is the area we're focusing on today uh, where we carried out this project and it's an area encompassing the town of Halifax and as you can see from the picture it's very beautiful in the springtime with the daffodils out. Um, and it has a population of around 200,000 people. Uh, from a mental health perspective within Calderdale, we have three inpatient wards catering for up to 72 patients at any given time. Wards are led by a multidisciplinary team, including doctors, nurses, social workers and occupational therapists. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they're run by a team of nurses and healthcare assistants. And there are always an average of two qualified nurses per shift per ward. Despite handover at the start and end of each shift, not all patients are going to be completely familiar with every qualified nurse, especially as patient turnover is generally quite high. Despite, um, so out of normal working hours, um, which is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, we have one on-call junior doctor who's the first referral source for qualified nurses to come to in the event of a medical or a psychiatric emergency. <coughs> Pardon me. Or any clinical queries. Um, the junior doctors on call at Halifax are not necessarily familiar with all of the, the wards. They're based off-site and they're reached by telephone and they may potentially not be able to respond immediately. As we can see, therefore, within this system, there are many potential sources of error. Um, differing healthcare professionals communicate in different ways and they have different training, culture, backgrounds and genders. They're regularly separated in place as well. <coughs> so, and this is complicated further by the fact that we're having so many shift patterns means that uh, single patient uh, care will involve multiple personnel. All of the above, therefore, requires consistent, uninhibited, reliable communication of patient details. And also, we need to be able to ensure, sa to ensure safe decision-making, prioritisation and triage. So communication. 
Well, communication failures, we know, are one of the leading causes of inadvertent patient harm, and that's been demonstrated time and time again. The largest source of evidence I saw was from the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Health Corps Organisation in the US, uh, where over 70% of serious incidents uh, were accounted for by communication error. And these high rates have been report, uh, repeated in other national and independent reports. Psychiatry is also prone to such errors. Medication errors are the most commonly uh, 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 sort of type of error, but communication failure and distraction are the most commonly cited reasons for this. Psychiatry relies also on the communication of suicide, and this suffers not only from human communication error, but also psychological barriers to communicating it, such as uh, emotions, unresolved grief, and negative judgments about suicide. So standardised methods of communication are used in industries that put human life at risk, for instance in the military and the airline industry. The World Health Organisation has advised the use of standardised communication tools um, when handing over communications between staff and between different uh, patient care units in its uh, 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 patient safety so uh, solutions document in 2007. And standardised communication tools are being championed throughout the world as ways of improving patient safety and quality. SBAR is one such tool. The mnemonic stands for Situation, Background, Assessment and Recommendation and it provides a framework for communication and encourages the user to be precise and planned before making a referral so that the correct information is communicated efficiently. It aims to prevent missed information. SBAR was originally developed in the US uh, in the military to standardise communication and debriefs but its potential for use in the healthcare setting uh, was recognised by Leonard in 2004 and it's since been uh, recommended by the WHO and more locally in the UK by the NHS Institute for Innovation and Clinical Improvement. Within the South West Yorkshire Partnership Foundation Trust where we work, the need for high quality, efficient and safe handovers between nurses and doctors has been identified as a primary goal. And as such, George Smith and myself set out <clears throat> to introduce the SBAR communication tool for making referrals between different healthcare professionals. To do this, we, uh, we, so we set out with the aim to see if this improves the quality and efficiency of referrals, and we wanted to pilot this, uh, this in three wards. And this is the pilot I'm presenting you today. We used the three aforementioned wards in Halifax to do it. For our method, um, we, took, uh, we, we used junior doctors as our... Uh, sort of to help us collect the data, and we asked them to fill in referral evaluation tools, which we devised, rating the quality of and the time taken for uh, referrals over the telephone from nurses on the inpatient ward. We'll call this time period, or this three weeks, T1 from now on. We then trained all qualified nurses to use SBAR using a train the trainer scheme, and we also placed aid memoirs on the ward using posters, telephone handset stickers, <coughs> and notepads. All training materials were kindly provided by the NHS Institute for Innovation. The training uh, lasted two months, and after training, we repeated the data collection period um, using the same referral evaluation tool. Each referral was assessed on the time in seconds to complete the referral and the questionnaire score. The questionnaire assessed how well the referral had met the four headings of SBAR, situation, background, assessment, and recommendation, and it used four Likert-style questions, scoring one point for strongly disagree, and five points for strongly agree. All questions were weighted equally, and there was also a fifth question relating to the doctor's ability to make a clear decision, and that was scored as above, but considered separately. The collection tool was devised by the SPAR steering committee, which was made up of myself, George Smith, and also the senior nurses from each of the piloted wards. Only new referrals from the participating wards were included, and only ever, every other referral was captured, thus ensuring that the people making the referrals didn't know which one was being recorded or not, uh, adding an element of blinding. The survey forms were collected daily, and the junior dots on call were reminded to fill in their questionnaires every day. <coughs> so looking at our results, well, we managed to train 88% of the nurses, and all of the nurses who weren't trained were all accounted for for long-term sickness. Looking at our results, well, in T1, we collected 30 refer referrals, and in T2, 26. Figure 1, we'll, look, um, we'll go through kind of, uh, quickly, uh, demonstrates the, uh, uh, the, sort of the time and the referral score and the decision score. We'll see that the, we see that the mean time to complete a referral after training reduced from 193 seconds to 91 seconds. There's a very large range on this, you'll see. Uh, but it is significant with a p-value of 0.047 if you look at the um, uh, inferential testing. 
Junior doctors, when filling in the forms, of course, responded with mixed views because it's quite a subjective thing. Uh, but the mean referral quality score, so the judgment of how well the referral met the SPAR headings, also improved by an average of two points post-training, which is again significant with a p-value of 0.042. The mean score and how well junior doctors felt able to make a clear decision also improved by 0.5 points post-training, which had a p-value of 0.035. The variability of all the data uh, in, uh, reduced post-training as well. We tested the, uh, the questionnaire for internal reliability using Cronbach's Alpha, and that came back with a good score of 0.859. Uh, and reliability of the individual questions were also assessed and all showed good reliability. Alpha reduced if an item was deleted. So looking at conclusions, well, first of all, we need to recognise the limitations of this study. It is a pilot study, and the numbers are very small. Uh, also, the material being studied is pretty complex and varied, and, and people uh, sort of approach this with a subjective nature. So to, getting a standardised tool to capture that is very difficult to conceive. There are also obvious limitations caused by referral survey bias. Uh, myself and George knew all of the junior doctors taking part and most of the nurses taking part as well. So they may have, been one, they may have positively skewed results, possibly um, trying to help us, or if they didn't like us, possibly trying to hinder us. Um, <clears throat> it was not possible to match T1 and T2 scores either for a particular nurse. And as a consequence, the groups were considered to be independent when looking at analysis, and therefore, they weren't pa uh, therefore paired inferential testing wasn't possible. So that results in a loss of power. But despite this, we can see that post SPAR training, we've seen both a reduction in the time spent making, it, uh, making a referral over the telephone and an improvement in the perceived quality of the information co uh, conveyed, allowing for clearer and safer decision making. Based on these results, we are undertaking further work um, and uh, we're moving out, running out SBAR throughout South West Yorkshire Partnership. Uh, and that means we've got 26 wards now to, uh, to conduct a larger project in. Um, we, this means we've got, we can refine the methods slightly and we're actually uh, in T1 and T2 we're questioning both the nurses and the doctors to give us a more balanced view on, on how people are perceiving the, um, the tool and improvement and also we're going to get hopefully much larger numbers. We've already uh, completed T1 actually uh, and uh, training's about to start in the next one to two weeks. Um, just before I finish, I'd just like to say a few thank yous. I wanted to thank the SBAR Steering Committee. Uh, I'd also personally like to thank my educational supervisor at Leeds University, John Holmes, and my academic supervisor at Wakefield, Professor Stephen Curran. Um, we would like to thank all the junior doctors and nurses who helped us with data collection, and also like to thank the NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement, providing all the study materials and training materials. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank our trust who have supported us through this um, uh, project throughout. Uh, any questions, please? Well, yes. thank you very much for that. Um, could I ask, for the recording, it, I know it's, it's awkward, but if you could make your way to a microphone and, and ask the question from a microphone, that's really helpful. Thanks ever so much. And also, if you could just introduce yourself, say, say who you are and what, what country you're from. That's lovely. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, from Kuwait, and uh, I just don't remember you going over the tools. Did, did you, I mean, can you... Explain it in more detail. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, sorry, I'll come to the microphone. Um, <coughs> so the tool is a very simple questionnaire. Uh, I didn't go through it just because of a time limitation. Um, the, it, it basically asked the, uh, the, the junior doctor to record um, which ward was phoning and uh, how long they spent on the telephone and the time of the referral. It then used a series. We had five Likert scores. So the first question said, um, how, did this, um, how well did this referral explain the situation in general? And then you have to range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Five points for strongly agree, one point for strongly disagree. And, 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 sort of, and the range in between. And the rest of the questions went through their SBAR format. So the second question was um, about how well, did it meet, how well did it explain the background of the patient and the assessment and the recommendation. And the final question said, how well did you feel you were able to make a clear decision given the information posed? And again, it was a like heart scale. Lovely, thank you. Any other questions? I, I have a question actually, which is, and do you think your um, that that tool, that sort of measurement tool you've you've devised there, um, do you think that could be used to assess other forms of communication? So, uh, obviously, yeah, in your setting, you looked at verbal communication. Would this be relevant? Do you think for for written referrals? Um, it certainly would be, and it, you might be able to actually, because you could then have one assessor. It might be a much more standardised way of, of going through these as well. Um, I looked into lots of, using lots of different tools to capture it with a literature review on, on SBAR. 
and people have tried lots of different methods in order to assess how effective SBAR is. And none of them really were, were, were ideal because it is such a subjective um, uh, uh, sort of topic. I think the best one I saw was um, a group who uh, took, vi uh, took audio recordings of, uh, of the referrals and then had an independent blinded assessor judging those with a tool. I think that was a good way of doing it, but it threw up all sorts of ethical implications for this pilot study that we didn't want to broach. Indeed. Um, a, and a, a follow-up to that, actually, which is it, on that topic you just raised about the, the subjective nature of the rating of the third thing you measured, the, you know, the ability to make a good clinical decision. Yep. Um, what's your feeling about how, um, how valid a metric that was? Are there other ways? You, you know, do, are you confident in that as a metric of, of the impact of SBAR? Well, it's obviously subject to quite a lot of bias. And I suspect the, the doctor at the end of the telephone wants to feel they're making a clear and good decision. Now, that's the reason in the second time round when we repeated the study, we've asked the nurses at, uh, at the other end of the telephone to say, how well do you think the, the referral that you got back was a, was a kind of good response to your question? Do you think you, the doctor understood you? We've asked, and we've asked, did they prioritise well? And, and did they... Um, uh, actually forgotten the third question off the top of my head now but because we wanted to try and get a bit of a, a separation from that because it can be very easy for people to think I'm making great decisions and really they're maybe not. Mm, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Fleming Jacobsen from Denmark. Thank you for, for the presentation. You. So as I understand it, now you have trained the, the nurses to give better messages to the, to the doctors so that they can prescribe. Have you any thoughts on training the doctors in better communication too? Yes, um, we've been doing that at the same time. Um, so we've been, while we've been training the nurses, obviously we've been training them at the appropriate, the doctors at the appropriate times. So um, uh, we've, I've been Sort of doing training with the junior doctors, and we will be sort of for the second part too, because it's obviously very important that communication is both. And if we have good results coming forward, we'd hope to roll SBAR out throughout the whole trust, not just in an inpatient side of uh, things, so that that can um, you know, then be used in referrals um, sort of throughout the whole, uh, the whole of our healthcare system um, between different interprofessionals. Yeah, so my comment is only if you train interprofessional co uh, collaboration. I think it's important to train all parts, not only one. Absolutely. As it, it might uh, sound a little bit critical, but it may be also is because <laughs> you, you have focused on training the nurses here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, absolutely, you're, you're completely right. I, I, I agree with you 100%. But this, um, for the, the purposes of the study, that's where we decided to put our focus. Lovely. Thank you. Any other questions on this presentation? Can I get a feeling in, in the room? Could you put your hand up if you have previously come across the SBAR tool for communication? So a lot of us have, so the majority of us have, but quite a lot of us haven't. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, George. <laughs> um, our next speaker is going to be Anne Boat. Um, who is going to um, address the same topic, but as you'll see from a very different perspective. Um, although we are later coming back to SBAR. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist, and that means that I'm very good at putting people to sleep, but I'm going to try my hardest <laughs> over the next 10 minutes to keep this audience awake as I talk to you about improving intraoperative handoffs among anesthesiologists through the implementation of an intraoperative handoff checklist. Um, as a little background, this work was done at Cincinnati Children's <coughs> Hospital Medical Center. It's a 577-bed pediatric institution that's found in the Midwestern portion of the United States in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital is one of the busiest pediatric operating rooms in the United States. We anesthetize approximately 38,000 patients annually in 43 anesthetizing locations, and we have a team of about 45 anesthesiologists that I work with, and we oversee uh, 10 pediatric anesthesia fellows and 40 nurse anesthesia providers, which in the United States we call CRNAs. 
Um, certainly with the pace of our practice and with the acuity of the cases that we see, communication is crucial to the safe passage of patients through our perioperative environment. And as was presented so well in the first talk, um, handoff we know is a time when there can be breakdown in that communication. Our department has worked really hard to create safe handoff protocols between the anesthesia team and handing off to other teams within the hospital. So when we're handing off to the recovery room nurses or the pediatric intensive care or the neonatal intensive care or when we have our um, mothers who undergo fetal surgery and we're taking them to the fetal care unit, we've actually done a very good job with this. But what we found when we actually looked at our own internal practice is we were not doing a good job of handing off to one another. When we looked closely at this practice, we found it was very inconsistent. While some anesthesiologists were handing off in the other operating room, some were actually handing off in the anesthesia lounge, in the hallway, I hate to say it, but a few people were caught handing off over the telephone. Um, we found that when the handoffs were not occurring in the operating room, that often the in-room anesthesia provider, that CRNA or that fellow, wasn't aware in a timely fashion that a handoff had even occurred. And certainly, when you're not handing off in the operating room, you don't have that sense of situational awareness of what's going on in that case at the time that you're providing handoff. And so we found that incomplete information was being passed on. And so as you can see, when you put this all together, we were really setting ourselves up for medical errors. So fortunately, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we have the Anderson Center for Health Systems Excellence. And they put together a program called the Intermediate Improvement Science Series, or what we like to call I2S2. And this is a program that's aimed at developing improvement leaders through teaching systems thinking and teaching the model for improvement. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to participate in this program and to be a leader on an improvement project. And I chose to try to improve our <coughs> intraoperative handoffs among the anesthesiologists. The first step was to put together an improvement team which consisted of several anesthesiologists as well as several nurse anesthesia providers. And we all sat down together and we tried to come up with what are the most important components of a good intraoperative handoff and we really found two critical elements. One was we felt that the handoff must occur in the operating room and it had to include that in-room anesthesia provider. And number two, we felt that the information had to be shared in some sort of standardized fashion. So as you do with any improvement project, we started by gathering baseline data and we observed handoffs for a period of a month and we found that only 20% of the time were both these two critical elements occurring together in our handoffs. So we then moved on to develop our SMART AIM and our key driver diagram and many of you are probably familiar with, with this format. But our SMART AIM was to improve the quality and reliability of attending intraoperative handoffs from 20% to 95% over a six month period of time with the global aim of preventing errors that can occur after an incomplete anesthesia handoff. We next identified several key drivers of our process and I think probably the two most critical ones are the first two which is understanding the importance of improving the handoff process by the anesthesiologist and that's really just saying we need the anesthesia team to buy into the fact that this was an important change to make and also we needed to develop that standardized handoff tool. And so to address the second key driver, we decided the best thing that we could do was actually develop an intraoperative handoff checklist. And to sort of address that first key driver, we decided that we were going to really try to pull in the anesthesiologists in our group to help us develop this handoff tool. And we did this through multiple PDSA cycles. We had a very rudimentary tool to start with. We put it out there to a few of the attendings. We said, please use this today. They came back to us with feedback. We revamped the tool. And this went on for actually several weeks until we came up with a tool that most of our um, department agreed could really address the needs of our department across a wide variety of cases. As you can see, it was very simple. Nobody wanted anything that was lengthy, but they wanted something that actually um, was a reminder of what they needed to discuss um, with each handoff. Once we had actually developed the handoff tool, we then moved forward into utilization of the tool and encouraging utilization. And again, we did multiple PDSA ramps on what's the best way to get people to utilize this tool. And um, we did very simple things, posting reminder signs in the operating room, don't forget the handoff protocol. Um, and then we actually really focused in on the failures that occurred. 
if you failed to hand off via the protocol, you received an email within 48 hours, and then you received a phone call 24 hours after that from someone on the improvement team who, you know, not only stressed the importance of this initiative, but also said, now, why didn't you use the handoff tool? Why didn't you hand off in the operating room? Because we found that there were also some barriers that we had to fix to being able to comply with the protocol that we had put forward. Um, and so as you see from our run chart, um, this is over a six month period of time. We started out a little rocky. We had quite a bit of work to do. But by about four months into the process, we actually achieved 100% of um, our handoffs meeting the criteria that we laid forth. And we were able to maintain that through the rest of the six month period of time. Now, of course, our question, and I'm sure your question sitting there is, but is this sustainable change? Well, we felt like the best way to sustain the change was to actually take this safe handoff checklist into incorporate it into our electronic medical records. Um, we actually at Cincinnati Children's use a Centricity electronic medical record system, which allowed us to create a safe handoff script. So now when the oncoming attending or anesthesiologist goes to sign into the case, it actually pops up the safe handoff checklist. And they can go down and they can tap on each of the lines that you see, and it will populate the anesthesia record that these items were discussed at the time of um, safe handoff. So, um, in terms of the lessons that I learned going through this project, you know, we obviously had a very, very ineffective handoff system. And I think that was because it was just embedded in our culture. I can't tell you the number of anesthesiologists that said to me, I have been doing this for 20 years, I've been handing off this way, and I've never had a complication. And, um, and you know, those were the hard people to change their behavior. But thankfully, I had a number of early adopters to this process who felt that this um, project was important and they were very instrumental in bringing along the rest of the group and advocating for change. We were also very transparent throughout this process. If you failed, we told you you failed. And it, when we were succeeding, we were the biggest cheerleaders um, for our group. And uh, we also made sure that the run chart was always posted somewhere where people could follow the progress that the division was making. Um, because we had worked on other handoff processes in the past, I think that we had some divisional readiness in terms of understanding how um, to participate in a quality improvement project, and we had excellent leadership support. One of the fascinating things that came out of this is we actually developed some sort of team, I think without even trying to do this, some sort of team huddle approach to these handoffs where we now had both the anesthesiologist in the operating room talking with the in-room anesthesia provider. And every now and then the surgeon would look over the drape and add in comments or we'd have the circulating operating nurse come over and join in on the handoff. And so we were actually gathering more information at that time than we ever had in the past. So uh, certainly I'm a great believer now that QI methodology and multiple tests of change can be an effective tool to change practice in the operating room. I am by no means a QI specialist. Um, I'm not an outcomes researcher. I'm someone who works on the front line every day with patients. And um, as I've been listening to presentations in this conference for the past day and a half, many people have talked about really engaging the frontline people in quality improvement initiatives. And I think that's very, very important. I think they have some great ideas on how to make things better. And I also think that they are major stakeholders in improving the processes that are part of their daily work life. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anne. Any questions for Anne about that work? I have a really trivial one, actually, which is, could you explain bagel party? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we all know that one of the best motivators of getting something to happen is to offer up food. And I had told my department I would bring breakfast when we reached 100% compliance. And uh, so, that's what happened. And believe it or not, I don't think that sustains change, but it sure certainly gets my department motivated. Thank you. <laughs> and w were you surprised at the, the speed with which you got from a not great rate to 100%? 
Um, I was. And in fact, when we first hit 100%, I thought, okay, this is like a blip on the radar and we're going to head back down. But I think we had a couple of factors working for us. I think our improvement team was very, very diligent. We were in the operating room every day. We were talking about this project. We were talking to people that weren't coming on board. And I think also the fact that we had done other improvement projects in the past and our divisional leadership really stressed the importance of this helped us to move um, you know, the data points fairly quickly. I was not expecting to hit 100%. You know, now that we've actually embedded it into the electronic medical records, it just, it, it's almost become, you know, part of our new culture because it pops up, you run the list with someone, and it populates the electronic medical record, and you're sure it's set to go. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please do. Yeah. Feel free to, it's a bit awkward, isn't it? So feel free to sort of <laughs> wand, make your way towards the microphone. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. That was really interesting. I love the huddle thing. <laughs> That's nice. L lovely idea of sort of huddling off in the uh, anaesthetic room, handing over. But what risk was there initially? What risk, I understand that it seems risky, but did you have any concrete evidence of risk? Happening? We did, you know, and I didn't go into it because of time, but we actually had a medical error that was associated with an incomplete handoff. We had um, a case that was only supposed to last for four hours that actually went on for 12 hours. There ended up being two different handoffs of care um, with anesthesia teams. And, um, you know, I liken it a little bit to the game of telephone in the U.S. that kids like to play where one phrase is said in somebody's ear and then you whisper it down the line and by the time it gets to the last person it's completely distorted. It's truly what happened in this case. The first anesthesiologist felt like because the case was lasting longer they needed to draw a uh, type and screen and cross for blood. The second anesthesiologist comes on not realizing that the first anesthesiologist had done this. Um, they just knew blood was available, went ahead and transfused. And then the third anesthesiologist just comes on not really realizing how the process had progressed and um, decides that this child because of the long operative course and the blood that had been transfused needed to go to the ICU and of course that third anesthesiologist is me and I go out to talk to mom and say you know there's been a change in plans and you know because of the blood that your child has received in the volume we feel like she would be safer to go to and the mom looked at me like this and said I never consented for my child to have blood and, of course, at that moment, I realized that there had just been such a terrible communication gap the whole way. People were doing things, and they weren't passing it on in the handoff. And that's why you would see specifically up there, we have labs to trigger the idea of passing on, you know, information about labs. But we also have blood and blood consent, you know, type and screen and blood consent. Because, of course, this mother was a pediatrician, and she looked at me with wide eyes, and I felt terrible. Now, you know, there wasn't direct patient harm, but we certainly didn't follow the protocol of our institution, and that was all a lack of communication from one anesthesiologist to the next. Um, that's great, but it's just the one case, and single cases make bad law. There's a lot of money to spend for a single case. Must there, there must have been m more evidence you didn't collect that... I, you know, I, there was definitely quite a bit of anecdotal evidence. I think a lot of people are not very forthcoming in talking about um, when a handoff, when they're not giving off the appropriate information that they should be giving off. Um, so, I, you know, I, what I can say is we, not have, we track actually very closely our, our safety events and, and any sort of serious safety event. We have not, since we implemented this, we have not had any um, serious safety events associated with lack of communication from one anesthesiologist to another. Um, I can also say that people are really pleased now with the information that they're getting. Um, you know, there would be times where there'd be an anesthesiologist who was very um, busy and I'd say, I need to hand off this room to you. And they'd be like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just look at the record. And they'd run away. You know, that sort of thing. And that never happens anymore because we have a set, a set tool. Again, I thought that was a really good talk. Um, and my question has probably been partly answered. I was just going to ask a bit about your outcome measures and perhaps balancing measures that you study, because obviously your main, um, I've done a bit of stuff on checklists in acute medicine, and also we have a huddle sort of handover as well. And it's easiest to collect the, the process measure in terms of our compliance with the checklist and our, and our huddles. 
Um, but I found outcome measures quite difficult because they're very rare for us right. at least. Um, so did you use any other measures and how did you find collecting that data? No, you know, we, you know, we really didn't look at, at any outcomes and it's something that I think we need to think about now that we've actually, um, you know, kind of have a set process in place. But again, since the, the incidences are fairly rare, um, it, it's, it would take a lot, a long time to collect them. But I think we all agree that one incident is one way too many. And, um, and we certainly had one that was enough to have us sit up and take a look at what we were doing. Lovely, thank you. Any other questions for Anne? Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. We now have uh, Dr. Anna Evans and Dr. Richard Hughes, who are going to tell us about their piece of work. Okay, hi there. You can see the title here, and you might be thinking you've heard about it before. Um, it's true that we uh, work in a very similar setting to um, the gentleman who made the first presentation, and we also implemented the same tool. We weren't aware that there were other people engaged in that type of work, although I guess we could have expected that. Um, my name's Dr. Uh, Richard Hughes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Anna Evans. We've come from the Wessex Deanery. Um, we're actually in training to become psychiatrists. We're first-year trainees, which means we've done our basic medical training essentially in general hospitals, and now we're just starting to specialize. So um, the area where we work is the, uh, on the south coast uh, in Hampshire. It includes uh, areas around Portsmouth primarily. So, uh, and, and the talk, it's uh, about the implementation of what we consider to be an innovative uh, communication tool. This is the SBAR communication tool in a mental health setting. In this presentation, we're just going to discuss out-of-hours communication, which is where, what we focused on, um, what SBAR is, and also how we implemented it in one of the hospitals that we cover. I'll just hand over to Anna. Thank you, Richard. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what our job is and wh why, why there was a problem that we felt needed to be addressed. So, as Richard said before, we are from the south coast of England, um, working in the Portsmouth area. Um, out of hours on call, we're expected to cover three sites, which are indicated by the red dots there on the, on the map. Um, that's mainly after five o'clock at night and at weekends. Um, as you can see, they are quite far apart and that can cover about 50 miles. Um, so this sort of leads on to why, why we needed to do something about communication. Um, just a bit more about the calls we might get out of hours. We are expected to respond to calls about new admissions to hospital, um, also about medically unwell patients on the wards, um, and also sometimes mentally ill pa patients with behavioural difficulties that we need to help out with. So, talking a bit more about the challenges with our out-of-hours communication, um, we cover quite a large geographical area, um, and because of that, we can't be resident on site at all the areas. So we're often talking over the telephone to nurses on the wards about what's, what the problem is. Um, we work on call from 5 o'clock at night till 9 o'clock the next morning, so often we're getting calls at odd hours of the night. And then at the weekend, that's a 24-hour on call, so it's 9 one morning till 9 the following morning. Um, so obviously that can lead to challenges, getting calls in the middle of the night, often a few calls at once, so you have to, the calls have to be quick and effective um, in getting the right information across. We need to be able to prioritise from the information we get which call we respond to first, um, and especially if there's a patient that's physically unwell that we might need to think about transferring to a general hospital, we need to know if, which one that is and which one we should be thinking about going and seeing. Um, because of the wards we cover, we cover about 15 wards in total with lots of patients on each ward. Um, so handover after from 5 o'clock onto the on-call doctor is often quite inconsistent because you can't know about every single patient, otherwise handover will go on all night. <coughs> so obviously a lot of the time we don't know the patients um, that we're being called to see. Um, and because we're non-resident on-call, it's kind of a lack of a team feel in some ways because you're on your own essentially as a junior doctor, whilst you've got seniors on the end of the phone to speak to when you need to, you often on site on your own or at home. Um, so you need to be thinking about what you're doing 
and making a decision for yourself and deciding if you need to call a senior to ask for advice. Um, to go along with that, obviously there's a lot of changeover within our jobs. The junior doctors change over every six months, so there's new people coming to the wards all the time. Um, also, the nurses change around on the wards quite a lot, so there's not always the same team based on the ward. Um, consequently, you can be called to a site you haven't been to before by a nurse you don't know um, and about a patient you've never met before. So there's quite a lot of information to get across in a short period of time over the phone, really. Um, so I was just going to say, imagine you're the do junior doctor on the end of the phone receiving a call at 3 a.m. in the morning. You've got another couple of calls waiting. It's from a nurse that you haven't met before and um, it's about a patient you've never met and they're giving you some information and you need to make a decision what you need to do about that that patient, if it, need, if it needs to be seen within half an hour, which is our criteria for getting to the hospital, um, or whether it can wait and you can see someone else first. Um, and because of that, obviously, there's plenty of opportunity for miscommunication between, between doctors and nurses. And often, the nurses feel they don't get necessarily the response from us as the junior doctors that they want. We might, we might be busy on the other end of the phone and not necessarily come across in the best manner. So it's really important to have a good communication system for nurses to feel like they can communicate what they want to say and feel like they're being listened to at the end of the day by us and get the re response they want from us at the end of it. So I'll hand back over to Richard to talk a little bit more about our project. Okay, so um, like I say, well, I suppose both of us, we started our uh, training in hospitals, in general hospitals, where there's a lot of medically trained nurses, um, and uh, we're working in a large team. There's always uh, x-rays, there's always senior support in all the different specialties, or at least in the large um, general hospitals. There is, and I heard um, about SBAR. The nurses on the ward that I worked on were always going off um, to have their SBAR training. And I eventually figured out what it meant, and it seemed reasonable to me. Um, but I didn't think that much about it. When we started in psychiatry, um, it became clear that no one had ever heard of that, uh, and it, <laughs> it was really a desperate need for it, because the telephone messages we were getting were very poor. Um, and Basically, it didn't allow us to make any kind of decision or even form an impression of the problem without constantly asking clarifying questions. And as things have become busier, um, recently specifically, uh, we often, as Anna said, have calls waiting for us. Um, so we need to prioritize. So as far, I don't want to duplicate too much, but it's a situation um, giving, uh, I'm nurse such and such from Ward, such and such, um, calling about this patient who is detained under whatever section of the Mental Health Act, that's giving the background, maybe what their diagnosis is, a brief uh, assessment, or if they don't feel confident to make an assessment, and say uh, what they think the problem is, um, and then recommendation, which again, they don't have to say what they want you to do, but just, you know, I'd really like you to come here. Um, if a nurse uh, or a member of ward staff can get that out to you in the first little bit of the telephone conversation, um, It'll help us identify the most important points. Um, it means that the information is already organized. They already have it to hand. So it helps uh, the presentation of the information to others in a quick but coherent way. So when we identified this need um, for some communication skills training, um, <coughs> I know there was a question earlier about uh, how doctors should improve their communication skills as well. And I don't want to come across as saying that the nurses needed to communicate better for us to be able to do our jobs better. Um, but actually, mental health nurses in the UK don't generally have uh, a background in physical health. So they're often quite uh, a lack of confidence in terms of assessing medical situations and knowing what was... Um, important to hand over, recognizing abnormal results. Um, so this was designed, uh, or it was the way we implemented it was to help them with that. So we surveyed junior doctors. Um, the way we did this was we had SBAR. Um, we knew that there were important communication points there. Uh, and we asked the SHOs, the junior doctors, to rate each call that they had. We took uh, sort of up to 50 sequential calls. Um, in terms of how they thought it satisfied the criteria in a very similar way to the other project. Um, they didn't know why we were doing this, and the nursing staff didn't know that we were measuring it. Um, we also interviewed the nurses. 
with a, a short question that Anna devised, um, which was to explore their confidence in handing over um, information out of hours to doctors and what they thought the problems were. Um, we then made early contact with the nurse managers, and I think this was the key bit of how we implemented SBAR. Um, we arranged a meeting with the uh, nurse in charge of, of the whole unit and also the ward managers themselves. We explained SBAR in a similar way that we're doing now. Um, and our intention was that we would then train the ward staff, um, resurvey, re-interview. Um, to our surprise, the nurse managers were very, very enthusiastic about it and actually took it from us. They said, okay, we'll arrange all the training, we'll do all this kind of stuff. And so we were very pleased that they, that they bought into it. So the ward staff were trained. Um, again, similarly, we were provided with SBAR prompts from the uh, NHS Institute, which we made available to them. Um, and after a period of several weeks, we then resurveyed the SHOs and we re-interviewed the nurses. So before SBAR, uh, in general terms, the nursing feedback was that there was a lack of confidence communicating with doctors out of hours, and that manifested itself in a number of ways, um, which I won't go into just now. Um, that's a, a qualitative. In terms of quantitative, um, we scored out of eight each of the calls, or rather we asked the uh, SHO to score out of eight. Um, the highest score was five out of eight. So um, each of the S, B, A, and R had sort of two points each. And quite a lot scored zero. So if you can imagine a call where the nurse doesn't even say um, who they are uh, and, or what the patient's name is, um, it would be something like, uh, you need to come um, because one of the patients is ill. And that's all, all we would get. And, and that was the frustration um, that, we, that gave us the incentive to carry forward this work. This is a simplified version of the graph that's on the handout, which is on the website. Um, I put in white all of the wards that weren't involved in the implementation of SBAR, and I've put in red the wards that were involved. Okay? So you can see that they're all grouped in the lower half there. We implemented it as I've described before. After SBAR, um, the nursing feedback with this tool, uh, they felt that they did have uh, an increase in confidence because there was some structure to what they were saying. They had all the information collected beforehand. They felt um, empowered. They felt listened to. And uh, I think there was a, a greater chance of mutual understanding. This is the graph. Um, as you can see, the red um, is over there on the right-hand side. Um, I've got the figures in the next slide. Um, but just looking at it, you can see that the wards not trained were still down at the lower end. The nurses, uh, the wards that were trained are up at the higher end there. So 49 calls beforehand. AMH is adult mental health. Uh, OPMH is older person's <laughs> mental health. Um, and we rolled it out on the OPMH wards. Um, because it was a different sort of uh, um, organizational structure, so it was easier to go in with all of the OPMH wards. Uh, average score for adult mental health was 1.76 out of 8. Average score for uh, older persons was 1.5. Afterwards, um, a slight improvement with adult mental health is 2.9, but a huge improvement uh, in older persons, that's 5.81. Also, uh, what we noticed anecdotally, and it, it sort of comes across in the figures, although they're very low, um, is that there was a reduction in the calls from older persons' mental health. Um, we speculated a bit about that, and uh, it could be that in gathering the information, they actually answered the question themselves, which is uh, um, why they didn't then call us. Uh, we don't have any concrete evidence of that. We'd need to uh, follow this up. So I'd say in terms of, of the next step, uh, we have demonstrated an improvement in communication, but uh, as the question before about outcomes was, um, it doesn't in itself mean that outcomes are better, although we would assume so. Um, what we could do is look at critical incident data from before and after the intervention, and this is what we'd look to do um, in the next sort of main study. This is just the pilot. Uh, we also will need to continually re-audit to identify further training needs as Anna said, because the nurse turnover can be quite high sometimes, and the doctors are always changing around as well. Um, we'd also like to roll it out to other <coughs> units or trusts if it does uh, prove to be 
as successful as, as we hope it is. Um, the other thing we're working at getting is the SBAR training integrated into the nursing induction. So every time a nurse starts, they will be trained in SBAR, which should help continue it. That's everything. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any questions on this presentation? Yes, please. Thank you for that interesting presentation. I'm Jackie Ellis and I'm from uh, Ottawa, Canada. I have a question about the two pieces of SBAR because I've had some um, experience with students doing a project and we trained the nurse, or they trained the nurses to use SBAR, but some of the physicians refused to accept SBAR. So you have your S, your B, your A, your R, and if the physician says, I don't want to know all that, just tell me one or two. So when you say you train the nurses to use SBAR, unless you train the physicians to accept SBAR, yeah. it doesn't work. Like the two pieces have to fit together. Right? So everybody has to understand what S means, B, A, and R. Accept it, listen to it, process it. But if someone says, forget it, just give me the R. Yeah, um, Did you have that experience? Uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, if you visit the NHS Institute stand uh, or look online at, at the resources, you can see that SBAR uh, can be used in many different settings. And some of it is physician-to-physician -physician communication, some of it's nurse-to-physician communication. Um, and I think you can make the argument that uh, you can always improve communication. What I would say is when we identified a need, um, the calls that we were getting almost, uh, had almost no information whatsoever. So I can see why um, other doctors might say, uh, you know, cut to the chase, really. Um, but since we're not in the hospital, we do need a good summary of the information in order to decide, <coughs> do I want to attend this ward which puts me automatically half an hour away from responding to the other ward, um, or, uh, or should I go to the other one? Uh, the SHOs, the doctors, didn't participate that much, so we didn't train them to receive SBAR. Um, but I remember in the sort of, uh, after we'd trained the nurses, I received a call, and it seemed remarkably good and complete, sort of uh, general hospital um, level of quality, and I was pleasantly surprised. I think the doctors that we work with were far more frustrated at the lack of information than, than I mean, than too much information. So I think that could be a problem, but because the communication was so, so poor to begin with, I think anything would have been an improvement. Thank you. I wanted to ask if you know um, what the time investment was in training the ward staff to use SPA. Well, I think we, we met with the nurse managers. So the in terms of when they trained them, a lot of the nurses were trained actually as part of their induction because at the time we were doing the, presentation, the project, actually the nurses were, there was a big changeover and there was a lot of new nurses coming in. So it actually was timed quite well because it, to them it seemed like something that was always being done. It wasn't a big change and there wasn't any sort of resistance to it. Um, there were a few nurses on the ward that had been there for a while um, and I think they were trained in, in their supervision sessions that they had with the nurse, nurses on a weekly basis. So I don't think there was a great deal of time actually because in terms of actually getting across the message it was it's quite simple and having the prompts there actually really helps because all they had to do is look next to the phone and they'd have the system there so it didn't really need a lot of um, time in terms of training them it's, them itself. There's also a DVD that we showed, I believe was showed in the um, nurse's induction and um, that just sort of gave a quick snapshot and um, of an, a handover um, scenario um, which I think actually really in sort of five minutes really highlighted what, what we were trying to do. So I think that actually limited the time that was needed to be spent on doing that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hello, my name is Nina Jonsson. I'm coming from Norway, I work as a nurse. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the, um, the B, the background? Uh, how much do you want to know about yeah. the background? And, and, um, and tell me 
what is um, I don't work in psychiatrists, <laughs> so so I work in a hospital, and there we we use the news and mm-hmm. uh, to identify what we need to know and say. Yeah. Uh, so and, and further on, back how how much how much back do you want to go? <laughs> yes. So. Uh, the MUSE system sort of fits into the assessment. That's a modified early warning score. So uh, blood pressure is low, uh, that type of thing. In terms of background, I'd say it's, it's very important for mental health because if a person is detained under a, a section of the Mental Health Act, then we have extra things to think about in terms of transferring them to a general hospital or something like that. Uh, also, if uh, the patient has been suicidal for quite a while or if they've... Uh, they have frequent admissions to the ward, or um, they have had a low blood pressure at this time every night. That, that type of thing fits into the background. Um, and those are all important bits uh, to help us make our decision. I can see how in sort of a general hospital, just the brief snapshot, a brief medical snapshot, would be sufficient. For us, um, it's a little bit more involved because transferring someone to a, a general hospital uh, is also more involved too. Lovely, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So I just had a quick question. Just um, uh, obviously, one of our outcomes we looked at time. Yeah. Um, just anecdotally, do you think your referral, your, well, your time spent on the telephone has decreased? Because that was one of a really marked improvement from ours. I think in some cases it's probably increased, actually, because I think a lot of the time you'd get the call. You might ask a question to try and get some more information, mm. not actually get the information you wanted and think, <coughs> actually, I'm just going to go to that ward now because I don't really understand. So actually, I think, so the a call would then end. So I think actually in a lot of cases it's probably slightly increased. Um, I think some people might just stay on, have stayed on the phone a bit longer if it was something else. I mean, it partly depends on why you got the call in the first place. If you, it depends what sort of decision you're having to make. Um, so I don't know, we didn't have any evidence to show whether time, times were longer or shorter, yeah. but I would probably say in some cases they were probably slightly longer just because the calls were quite short beforehand. But I would just say about that, um, when we were in general hospital, um, a nurse could call us. Uh, this is uh, where maybe they hadn't attended their SBAR training. A nurse might call and um, say there's a problem with the patient. We'd then need to ask a clarifying question. Um, and we might then say, well, what medication are they on? They might say, oh, let me just go get, grab, the, uh, uh, grab the drug chart. What are their ops now? Oh, I haven't done them. Oh, well, could you ask someone to do them? So it could have shortened it in that way. Mm-hmm. And like I say, um, in gathering the information, maybe they might have answered the question themselves, which could cut out that call altogether. Yeah, certainly that's what we found. It was that back and forward, mm. uh, clarifying questions, gathering information that wasn't there pre-prepared mm. yeah. in the first place that, sort of, that, that was into sort of set after training. That sort of really reduced the times. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was the sort of big difference. But I was just wondering how it right, Thank you. We, we didn't think to <laughs> measure the time. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sanella, I'm from Norway as well, and I work in general hospital. <coughs> and we just started using um, SBAR, you call it SBAR, we call it ISBAR, because there's an I for introduction. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, if you only have the S, do you, have, do you always get the introduction from the nurse? or It's part of S, so in the prompts it does say in part of S to introduce self and patient. So, yeah, but I mean, that sounds like a good idea to have as a separate point. Yeah, because I'm thinking, mm. does it um, have any difference who is calling on the outcome and recommendations and stuff like that? I think so, and it also helps to build a bit more of a team. You know, if you've never met someone before, it's nice to be introduced and then you to introduce yourself and you feel like you're working more as a professional team and not just, you know, come here, we need to do this, and the doctor sort of asking a bit, uh, answering in a bit more of an abrupt way. And it's not, you know, it's not a nice team working environment, so it's much better to get on as a team if you know what someone's name is and, you know and then when you get to the wards you know who to ask for you know you know who's sort of been seeing the patient so it just promotes much better communication i think as a team as far as extended to include a d at the end which is decision yeah. i think it's reasonable to have the <coughs> i at the beginning which is introduction just to make sure that there is that mm. if we're covering different wards it's really nice to know where we need to go yeah 
Yeah. Sometimes you can tell which nurse it is. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask our, our fourth speaker, Elizabeth Renson, to come up. But I'm conscious we've all been sitting for a long while. And if you would like to stand and stretch your legs for a few moments, let's take the opportunity now. <laughs> I certainly need it. <laughs> okay, and then we all start singing now. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> right, lovely. Thank you very much. That was uh, welcome by me, me, if nobody else. Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present you our study on using video reflexivity for improving uh, handovers. Well, you're probably all familiar with the WHO uh, definition on handovers of being uh, transferring um, care for uh, one healthcare provider to another. And uh, in this talk, we'll, we'll be focusing on post-operative handovers. And they are of special interest, since they not only include the transfer of information, but also transfer of equipment. And furthermore, um, those handovers can be under time pressure, as the OR team needs to go back to the operating theater as soon as possible. And furthermore, they also in may include instable patients just after operation. Uh, improving handovers is an important patient safety goal. And uh, an often chosen solution for this is a checklist. And as the previous speakers have shown to you, checklists can be very, very useful. But we also know that implementation of checklists is often difficult. And furthermore, these checklists focus on what information is being transferred and not on how the handover is being performed. So in our project, we applied the video reflexive method for engaging healthcare professionals to improve handovers. And this method is based on the project Helix, uh, which is performed by Rick Idema. So what is this method? It contains five steps. And in the first step, engaging management and familiarizing with frontline staff is the most important. And after observing many handovers and being around on the wards, um, the facilitators start videotaping the handover process. And those first videotapes are shown back one and one to the persons on the video clips. <coughs> and based on the information they gave back to us, um, relevant parts of the videos are being selected and edited. And these relevant parts are then shown back in a multidisciplinary feedback session. And this session includes the whole team which is involved in the post-operative handover, so the OR team and the ICU team, or the recovery um, room team. Um, and in this improvement session, um, the, the professionals themselves come up and design a new way of doing a handover. And afterwards, in the last step of the method, the new handover is being implemented and evaluated. Well, in our project, we applied the method in six hospitals in the Netherlands. And in two hospitals, we focused on handovers from OR to ICU, and in the other four hospitals, we focused on handovers from OR to the recovery room. And only for the research purposes, we additionally filmed, and it was done by a professional cameraman, uh, in total 114 handovers. Uh, they were filmed before and nine months after the method was applied. And these handovers were coded by two blinded experts using a validated coding list to determine the quality of the handovers. Well, what were our results? Uh, first, I would like to show you the handovers being uh, coded with a very high quality. And as you can see, the percentage between before and after uh, handovers with a very high quality increased enormously. 
And the same was seen for handovers with a logical structure. Also, also here was a significant increase. And next, on this slide, I would like to show you the factors predicting handover quality. And these factors are information transfer, shared understanding, and team atmosphere. And for all these three factors, um, there was a significant increase in between before and after the, uh, the intervention. Um, well, next, I would like to show you two short video clips. Uh, one before and one after the video reflexive method. And uh, the video clips show a handover from um, a post cardiothoracic surgery in a pediatric setting. And, um, uh, well, the handovers are, of course, the language isn't Dutch, so probably most of you won't understand it. But I would like you to not to focus on what is being said, but how the handover practice is being changed. Okay, I hope this gives you a good impression of how the handovers looked when we first arrived. And I don't know whether there are professionals uh, uh, here in, in the audience, but I, I, yeah, I would like to know at the end whether it looked familiar with you. Um, now the second clip. This was filmed uh, nine months after we finished with our method. And, um, well, uh, this is how it looks now. Ah, you have a I'm open you over. Yeah, Frank, you have a beginning. Yeah. 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 Functional unventricular heart, gekregen, Norwood, with a boog, positive, and a atrium septum to run. It's all prima gegaan. And further, anesthesia will be skipped. Not so many problems, actually. We have to be prepared in time to get it we zijn niet van de pomp afgekomen uit het loop. Ja? Ja, dank je wel. So what have we learned? Um, I hope, um, especially the video clips, have to conf um, showed you that our method is very useful to change complex processes. And I would like to emphasize that it facilitates multidisciplinary learning. We learned that it's very important to use it only in a very trusted environment, since being videotaped um, is, is makes uh, professionals very vulnerable. And we believe that it also makes the implementation of changes a lot easier. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. Any questions on this uh, presentation? Thank you. That was a very good presentation. 
we actually use videotaping in our trauma bays so that we can actually go back and look at the way that traumas work since that's an also, also a multidisciplinary um, environment. But the question that I have, in, in, do you worry at all that certainly when people are being videotaped and they know they're being videotaped, mm -hmm. their behavior may be a certain way, but is this actually sustainable when the cameras are gone? And sort of ha how, how is the group going to sustain the changes that have been made when they know they're no longer being watched? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, uh, we, to start, we, 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 for the whole project, um, we don't start with videotaping. Um, we are on the wards for, for, uh, for several days, and, and um, so, so the, the, um, uh, the professionals are already very used and, and familiar with us before we start videotaping. And uh, when we start videotaping, uh, we videotape several handovers. And um, um, as this is a very um, yeah, complex, um, uh, yeah, how should you say it, dynamic actually process, um, I think the most professionals forget that they are being videotaped within a, a few seconds. But another important thing is I think that um, um, it, it appears that that's, uh, probably a lot of professionals will change their behavior, but in one way they, they don't know how to change their behavior. So they, they, we notice that, that showing them back and giving them back the video, uh, the, the material, that, that they were still very surprised, as, although they have been doing this work for, for, for years and years, they, were, they, they saw new things, and, um, and, and I think we are convinced that, that by, by looking at the video, um, the behavior of, of, of all professionals has changed, and, and, and once you've seen yourself, you, you can never act the same again. So, um, yeah, and to be honest, the, the, the clips I showed you were, were in our own hospital, and, uh, well, we, we come there still very often, and, uh, well, we're now, I think, uh, one and a half or two years later, and, and those handovers are still exactly the same as the after handovers. Thank you. Uh, following up on that, I, I wanted to ask, in the, sort of in the intervention, mm -hmm. did the professionals themselves define what a good handover was? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yes, indeed. We, we, uh, um, we were only there as facilitators. And, um, uh, and for me as a researcher, this is a very new but very interesting way to work because you now on the work floor and, and um, the professionals, they are the ones and they know the best how they can, um, how they can improve their work. Uh, but the thing the video does is that it enables them to, to change their way of working. And um, uh, so, so, yeah, we just were there and we listened and, and we were, were, well, we were just asking questions when watching with them to the videotapes, but, but just asking questions from what are you doing and, 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 and just asking and really to, to have a, yeah, to get a clue of, of what are the important um, discussion <laughs> themes and, and which uh, video clips should we select and, and give back to the, to the whole team. But the team was, the, yeah, they divided the, the, the new way of working. And so in the, um, uh, the six different hospitals that we, uh, uh, that we included in this project, uh, the interventions that were really done, so the changes that were made, were, were sometimes very different. We, we had uh, one, uh, uh, one hospital where they, 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 they came up with a checklist. They, they, they decided, well, we, we need a checklist. Um, and and, and they, they included the checklist in, in their uh, um, electronic system. But some other hospitals, they, they, well, they, they, they didn't want to have another checklist, but they, they, they changed other things. And, and what I think, and, and we've written it down, it's, it's a sort of system intervention because it was not that, that one thing has changed, as you could see hopefully in the video clip. Um, there were a lot of changes. Um, um, the, it was a similar type of patient, but first it was in, the patient was in a crib, and at the end it was in a, in the patient was in a bed. And, and this was just because the professionals start discussing, why are we using the crib? Yeah, well, it's a small baby, but it doesn't give us an, a lot of working space. So, so, they, they, so they came really up with, with the solutions, and, and uh, yeah, so you're right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One I, I, I following up on that actually, which is um, 
how many videos were taken of each professional? Um, well, we, we at, at, well, we didn't, um, of each professional, I, I, I don't, can, cannot give you the exact answer, but um, it, it was in the, uh, we, we videotaped in the recovery room and we were there, I think, for, for around four to, to four or five, five days, which were spread uh, in, in a period of two weeks. And, um, well, during these days, uh, I think we, we in, in the beginning, we, we just filmed a lot of uh, handovers. So then we filmed, um, well, 20 a day or something. And, and in the last part of the four days, we were more uh, watching with, 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 uh, with nurses and with anesthesiologists watching, watching the video clips. <laughs> so, uh, but for the, the, the ICU handovers, uh, we, we videotaped uh, less handovers because, you know, this is very complex surgery and they, they, well, they do it, I think, only six times a week. So, so we, we videotaped, um, I think, five or six handovers. But as those handovers were so, so much complex, we actually we needed only one handover to, 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 for, for the healthcare professionals to, to, have a, to, to make them change and to have a good idea and to en enable them to see, well, that's the way we're working and we should do it differently. Lovely. Thank you. Yes. Yes, could you mo move to the side so it's... Uh... Thank you. The session's being recorded, so uh, we ask everyone to use the microphone. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Lisbeth. Fantastic. Eric. You know, the achievements that you've presented are amazing, I think. That last point there uh, creates interest in and urgency for change. Can you talk about that? Because that's really, I think, the, one of the most interesting aspects yep. of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this, this urgency for change is, is, is a very important one, and it, it, I think it, it relates whether the changes are being implemented a lot easier. Um, what we realized is that, that um, well, it looks normal that if you have been working there all, all day in this practice, that, that you know how, how things are going on. But really the professionals needed to see themselves on the video, which suddenly they didn't realize, have I been doing this all the time? We, we went to, uh, for example, to uh, an ICU where an anesthesiologist um, was uh, doing a handover while the nurses were, were as you could also see in the clip, uh, uh, connecting a patient. And when I showed him the video clip, the first time he said, what? No one is listening to me. I, I'm talking to the back of patients. And, uh, well, it... It's, it may sound really weird that you don't know that, but well, he was so used of, of doing it that, that he really didn't realize it. And, and um, when, well, those things made that, 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 that he, he, well, he, 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 he would never do that again. He would always realize it. But also his team members, who also could, uh, sh uh, were shown those same clips, they also realized that, that that's the same thing they were doing as well. And um, I think another example is, is as you, I don't know whether you could see it on, the, on, on those two video cli clips, but um, in, in this version, they, um, when connecting the, the patient um, with these, these small babies, there are a lot of lines and they have to be calibrated and connected. And, and that went often, well, went wrong, but it, it took a lot of time actually. And um, when we were there, they, they said to us, yeah, we have this, this, this electronic thing and then we just have to plug in and plug out and plug in and you could see it it was in in the in the in the after clip um, and, and it was already there uh, but they hadn't implemented because there were one or two monitors on on the ICU which weren't yeah which weren't ready to do that and um, so when they saw the clip they immediately said no, we have to change it. This is this is really we, we can't work like that. So and and well, it also includes that. Well, I could have, have never thought of that. There was a different uh, way of technique of, of doing these these calibration of the lines. But um, well, they knew it was there, and and they realized well we can't continue working like that. We we have to and it and it was changed. I think within two days. So yeah, it's really. Uh, oh, Lovely. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Yep. Well, we've heard um, four different pieces of work looking at improving multi-professional communication. I'm actually going to ask 
all of our speakers to come up and join the table. I'm going to just move over to the podium. Because um, I thought might, there might be some questions about reflecting on all of them. Um, so we thought we'd, we'd allow a good um, 10 minutes um, in which we can, uh, we can pick this over together. Um, and I'm going to exert a bit of chair's privilege and ask the first question, if that's all right. Um, and you can, you can pick this up as you, as you feel, which is, um, is this a matter of instinct? Do professionals instinctively know what good communication is and we can just leave them to it? Or actually, do professionals need to be told, shown, what good communication is? Um, yeah. Um, yes, is this on? Um, well, I think um, I think you you have to. They they of course they know that that in normal communication you 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 watch each other and you you uh, um, you you sometimes repeat if if, if you think that that the, uh, the other person hasn't heard you. And I think in normal communication everyone knows that. But um, I think what is important that in 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 daily practice for for professionals who have been working there for years and years. Um, they don't realize anymore that that's, that's um, what, what they are really doing. And uh, um, so I think in, in mind they, they, they know what, what should be, can we do better, but you still have to, and you can do that by video, and you can do that in, in different ways, but, but they, they have to realize is what is going on. And to be honest, I was, was very surprised that, that they... Um, were yeah connecting patients and 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 transferring information at the same time, but but it's if you see it on the video, it looks very weird. But but if you see it in in real practice, it's it's very common. So it's it's I think yeah they they know it, but they have to to yeah be enabled to 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 recognize it again. Thank you. Well, yeah yeah. Uh, just I I think obviously communication is a for some people a very natural and inherent. Thing, and, so, and others not so. And, but the important thing within a medical setting is the importance of consistency and always having that information. So some people it may just come to, and training may not be a benefit to them, but to standardise and have everyone giving the same standardised information that's always going to be important is, is I think, the crucial part. And to add to that, I, I know that certainly in UK medical schools there's a lot of emphasis now on communication skills training, Whereas some people may do that very naturally, for those who don't, I think it's incredibly important. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sort of got to add on. Carrying on from what George was saying, really, I think um, having not been that long out of medical school, obviously we, we were trained quite a lot in communication skills at medical school, and there was quite a variance in difference of training in between different schools, I think. And we use some of the techniques that have been shown today, actually. We have at medical school we were expected to have a clinical scenario and be videoed doing it and then shown back and all these sorts of techniques actually are being used even before you get to the stage of working on the front line so I think it's really important that it does start early um, and then it kind of gets ingrained into you a bit more I think so yeah Lovely, thank you Does anyone else have any sort of reflections on, on this topic or, or questions about it? There's some very interesting things that come out of it yeah. Yeah. Um, very interesting question. Um, I uh, agree with all speakers. Of course, standardisation of what needs to be communicated is absolutely critical for people who are coming into the clinical setting who are not quite yet familiar with the kinds of issues that, are, that need to be communicated in what way and to whom and how. I think as soon as there's uh, some expertise that develops, people become... Uh, in not just uh, more able, but also require more kind of depth. They require perhaps more variation because of the complexity of the cases that people deal with. They cannot stick with a standardised framework. And it is here, I suppose, that we're starting to talk about the tension between learners in need of standards and experts in need of freedom to deal with the high-level complexities that they're facing. And I think what we need to start talking about is both standards and how now can we shift these people from standardised ways of communication into more expert based kinds of communication that enable people to deal with complex cases that is the real question I think I'd like to ask people who've been working on SBAR um, sort of how, you, how you respond to that, that sort of very real challenge isn't it really 
Do you think it is? A, do you think is that a problem for that observation? Is that a problem for standardised communication formats like SBAR? Um, I think it can be, um, but I think a tool like SBAR can be slightly adapted. I mean, in the terms of how we used it, it was you're almost trying to get across a bit more general um, information. It's not that expertise at that level. So it was a bit more generalised, but I think you could probably adapt the tool slightly, actually, to use in different situations to make it more applicable to certain expertise. Hmm? And could I say something about that, which I think goes back to the other question that was asked of us when we were up there about resistance um, to these standardized tools, that type of thing. Um, it's not just doctors, I suppose, that would resist a standardized tool. On one of the wards, there are a couple of nurses who have been sort of on the ward for 35 years, that type of thing, who honestly didn't believe that communication could be improved. Um, and it was difficult to overcome that resistance. And uh, one of the points in the earlier presentation about uh, early adopters, getting people on side, getting it to become part of the culture, I think was, is, is critical. Because if a couple doctors are saying, I don't want anything to do with that, then the rest will sort of follow and lines will be drawn. Whereas if you get a couple people who are championing it, or I think it, it depends on uh, what the setting is. I mean, it was pretty obvious for us that an improvement in communication would be good um, for us. It could be that uh, in the other setting that, that we didn't hear about, but the other setting that, that maybe it is all a bit too unnecessary and maybe they just need the bottom line, so maybe the tool needs to be changed because we don't want to be using tools that are inappropriate. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to set up an either-or situation. I think standardization is important, but I think it's also important that people get the opportunity, as Lisbeth has shown, to sit together and to say, what do we really need to do, given the situations that we're dealing with in our particular specialty? And, and come to form standardization that's flexible <coughs> and that suits them. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I'm from Anchorage, Alaska, and I work as a frontline nurse in a newborn intensive care unit. So we take care of complex, generalized, post-surgery, pre-surgery, all sorts of cases. It's very general, but it's very specialized. Um, we have used SBAR, theoretically. It was introduced, but it's not, it's not a hard and fast rule. It is something as, since we train both, we have student nurse externs, so that we have nursing students in the unit, they do certain tasks. We have new interns, we have full year in internships, we have fellows, nursing fellows, and we have people who have been there since, as my child would put it, since dinosaurs roamed the earth. So the, it's a tool to learn the kinds of questions and the kinds of information you need to gather when you're going to talk to a neonatologist at 3 o'clock in the morning. But it's also, it can be used for any rate of like complexity within the, that whole case. I mean, you can have a very complex case, but you're not just calling about one thing. It's, I think what it is is it works as a very well-rounded mnemonic in a very complex unit. But as you gain in and become more of an expert, you just unconsciously adapt the information that you deliver to your colleagues when you're looking for you know, questions or you want to transfer information. So I don't think it all has to be, you know, it doesn't always have to be, well, my S is this, my B is this, my A is this, my R is this. Um, it just becomes a little less formal. So it does, it does go across the board. Yeah, I think uh, the way we were implementing it, it's not pres prescriptive either. It was more as an aid memoir. So part of the uh, stuff that we were given from the NHS Institute is a notepad which has <coughs> S-bar on the side and then a section on the other side where they can make their notes. So if um, a mental health nurse uh, has encountered some sort of physical health problem which she's very anxious about, maybe the only trained nurse on that ward. She really wants help, um, and obviously we really want to help her, uh, him or her. Um, and so she doesn't have to follow it. 
Um, but when she sits down to look at it, she might think, oh, actually, yes, no, I need, do need to get that information, just reminding her the types of, in, of things that we're going to ask about when maybe she's a bit anxious about the situation and just wants help. Um, so, so, yeah. I completely, just to add to that, really, I completely agree with you. I think it's about getting a culture of good communication and getting a, a, a structure that everyone's sort of communicating effectively, but... You're right, it doesn't always have to be strict to the, to the line. I think that's just important. But it does mean that at the lowest common denominator, everybody's still doing it well. I think what's fascinating about this is that what we're teasing out is, is some of the themes that I think have been running through a lot of the sessions in, in the conference so far, which is that um, clarity and complexity are not enemies. That often the greater the complexity the greater the need for clarity. Um, the communication is vital, and the, one, of the, one of the things communication improves, which is vital and which communication is affected by, is culture. Um, and that, that, that somehow we have to, as, as, as improvers, find ways of tying together the <coughs> systematic and the unsystemizable, um, the, the technical and the humane. Um, and, and I think what's interesting is that although... I think, in, in a sense, all four of our presentations have come from very different starting points, and some of them have used the same tool quite differently. Actually, they've all ended up being about very similar things. They, you know, the, the people who've started with a very systematic communication tool have found that they've improved team working and communication and staff happiness. And people who've started from a very reflexive, uh, qualitative approach have found that some people have identified things they need to change in the working environment or designed a checklist as a result of it, which is really encouraging, isn't it? I, I think it, it, it emphasises the point you're saying about the power of, of trusting people um, to you know, give them tools, give them ideas, give them knowledge and data and feedback. And actually, we can trust our, our teams to come up with great solutions. Um, our time is up. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to our <laughs> presenters. Um, presentations, um, the, the slides and things will be on the forum website. Um, if you're interested in the SBAR communication tool, if you just Google SBAR, SBAR, you'll find lots of resources and some quick introductory videos as well. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>